can tell you that we have a real cracker of a lineup today uh, with speakers from all over the activist spectrum, the first of which is a real character uh, in, in our movement. Uh, he's an author, blogger, debater, and creator of liberatemankind.com. Uh, I first met him during Mid London's Million Mars March. We kept in touch, and he's shown a real, to be a real asset to the shift that we advocate. He's spoken numerous times at London Speakers Corner, in addition to giving a talk at our 2017 Z-Day. Uh, here this time to give a talk entitled In Search of Better Stories, please welcome to the stage, Eric. I got to say, when I, when I was first, um, when, I, when I first found out that I was going to be first up today, I, uh, I was slightly leery of it because, uh, quite frankly, I didn't want the responsibility of setting the tone for the whole day. But uh, the more I thought about it, the more I thought that actually what I've got to say might provide a really useful context for everything else that is going to follow, um, and I hope also it might provide a couple of potential solutions for the experience of powerlessness and uh, you know what can the individual do that sort of feeling that I think is pretty prevalent uh, among activists so um, I think as activists what we try and do and we're trying to change a system that is both pervasive and very very protective of itself what we need to find is a point an access point a point of attack something that I like to think of it as a nexus point which is connected to everything else right and that if you can weaken that just like a main structure in a building, if you can weaken that, it brings the whole thing down. And I think Peter Joseph in the Zeitgeist movies did an excellent idea of identifying money as that nexus point. And I came away from watching the addendum three or four years ago, whenever it was, thinking, my God, I actually understand for the first time just how profoundly and systemically corrupt our institutions are and how it's money that lies right at the heart of it. Um, and so... You know, if I went tilting at windmills, shouting at anyone that would listen, going down to Speaker's Corner, and <laughs> I was pretty convinced at the time that all you would have to do is explain it clearly to people, and once they realised just how fraudulent it was and how much it actually enslaves us as a society, that, you know, that, that's all that would be required to bring change about. But uh, I realised now that was pretty naive. Um, and... You know, the, well, the thing is, though, even if you do manage to get it across to someone and you do manage to convince them and they do see it for what it is, what's the individual supposed to do? The individual stands powerless against systems like the financial system, yeah, against systems like the governmental system, the corporatocracy. You know, the individual stands powerless. And so I think many of us feel, after a pretty short time, a sense of frustration that we can see what's wrong with the world, but we can't see what to do about it. And that's kind of what I want to address in this talk, because... I've come to realize that there's a level deeper than money, and it is more powerful because it's deeper, but it is also more accessible to us as individuals to do something about. And that level I'm talking about is what I've got labeled on that diagram is the metaphysical substrate. And by the metaphysical substrate, what I mean is the stories and myths and narratives that we tell each other to bind society together. And that is a point of attack that we as individuals and small groups can make a deal, can make a real difference with because our social systems grow out of a metaphysical substrate. So if you can change the substrate, the systems will change as a consequence of that. <coughs> So, uh, what I want to focus on in this talk is three things. Firstly, I want to get across to you just how powerful stories and myths are in affecting how we act in this world, how we orient ourselves in this world. I then want to go on and look at some of the prevailing stories and myths and narratives that exist in our society and show that they are bad stories and that they are bad stories because... They root us in what Jung called the shadow. And I want to introduce you, for those of you that don't already know about it, to the idea of Jung's shadow. And then the last part of my talk is going to be about Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, because I think that's very relevant to all of us. If we can see ourselves as being on that hero's journey, it is a motivator, and it gives us a sense of making a real and meaningful contribution to the change that we want to see in the world. So... To begin with, I'm going to tell you a little story, just to get across to you. Uh, this is going to be the first theme of my talk, is the power of story. And I can see no better way of doing that than by example. So let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there was a colony of mussels, and they lived on the riverbed. And they clung to the riverbed, and the water rushed past them. And all day, every day, they cling to each other, and they cling to the rocks, and they filter food out of the water. And all night, every night, they cling to each other, and they cling to the rocks, and they have a little sleep. 
And uh, after a while, one of the muscles starts to get agitated and he goes around and starts talking to the other muscles and saying, is this really all there is? Clinging to the rocks, clinging to each other, picking bits of food out of the water. I mean, is this really all there is? And so, well, well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, what happens if we just let go? What happens if we just let go and let the current take us? Oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Others have tried. You see those rocks down there? The current takes you, smashes you against the rocks. There's nothing you can do. But after a period of time, he just can't bear it anymore. And so he says his goodbyes to his friends and to his family, and he lets go, and off he goes. And sure enough, the current takes him away, bashes him against a couple of the rocks, round the bend of the river, and he disappears, gone forever. Now, if the story ends here, it's a really disappointing story, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and it's a really disappointing story because the hero's dead, right? What else is there? The hero's dead. And I want to come back to this later on, the importance of the hero's journey, because it's deep, deep, deep in our psyche, this, this unfolding of a plot. Um, and so, but anyway, this is not the end of the story. What actually happens is that as the muscle rounds the bend, he took a couple of knocks on the rocks, but that's what shells are for, right? So not seriously damaged. And uh, as the river rounds the bend, it opens up, widens, the current slows down, and he experiences all sorts of things. He gets involved in a singing group with some clams, <laughs> and he meets all sorts of other creatures that he's never seen before, and eventually he finds a place that he likes, he buys a shirt, and he settles down. <laughs> so, this is a pretty short, simple, even somewhat silly story. But even within that, I bet every single one of you has taken a couple of little morals messages away from that, right? Uh, I mean, I'd like to poll the room. I don't have that kind of time. There's a lot of stuff I want to go through today, and I do want to stick to my half hour, so I won't do that. But, you know, a couple of things you might take from it is, for example, that to risk everything in search of adventure is a noble goal in life. Or you might see it from the other muscles' perspective and say, well, actually... He's abandoned his friends and his family. They don't have him to cling to at night, you know what I mean? He's, he's left them poorer by disappearing off like that. Or a level deeper than that, you might think, well, perspective is everything, right? Because remember, from the perspective of the muscles he left behind, he was smashed against the rocks and was killed. So, you know, there are many, many clients, as I say, I'm sure there's many people come up with many different, many different interpretations, but the point is, you get into it straight away, right? You can't help yourself, straight away. Something about the story captures you. You live out the story as though you were one of the characters in it. And, and, and so it affects you not just on a mental, on an intellectual level, but on an emotional level, and even on a spiritual level as well. Brain scans indicate that when you're exposed to factual information, only one or two regions of your brain light up. But when you're exposed to narrative, when you're exposed to storytelling, multiple regions of your brain light up at the same time. To give you an even more concrete example, I called the Significant Object Study. Okay, so what, what the organisers of the study did was they employed the services of 200 writers, and they said to these 200 writers, go out to bric-a-brac shops, junk shops, whatever, and buy something, anything, for a couple of bucks, and then put it up on eBay and try and sell it. But before selling it, write a little story about it to give the object some significance in the, uh, in the minds of the people that are looking at the, at the ads. So these 200 writers spent between them a total of $250 on acquiring these little objects and sold them on eBay for just shy of $8,000. So this is another little example of just how powerful stories can be at grabbing our attention. So why are they so powerful? And Jung has a great deal to say about this. I don't have time to go deeply into Jungian theory, obviously. But I would like to just touch on it in a, in a, in a couple of contexts. So these are the 12 archetypes that Jung came up with. And what these, what these are are kinds of characters that you use in order to act in the world. Because we've got two parts of ourselves that need to be reconciled. We have our sense of being people, being organisms, being um, consciousnesses, but we also have to act in the external world. And to reconcile these two things, we create these characters and we tell ourselves a story and we become the lead characters in that story. And this sense of characterization and narrative and an unfolding plot in our lives is very, very fundamental to how we, uh, to how we apprehend the world and how we make sense of it. There's an infinite amount of information out there which we have to sort and make sense of and try and turn that into an interpretation of the world which is manageable and hopefully ultimately meaningful. I was hoping to do this without notes at all. I brought my bottled out and I brought them on with me anyway, but uh, yeah, I just want to get to where I am because I'm like four pages into my notes now, so I just want to get to where I am. 
Okay, so um, I'll come back, I'll talk a little bit more about Jungian stuff in a minute. This guy here, Yuval Noah Hariri, many of you may have read this book. Are there anyone in the room? Yeah, I can see a few people nodding. It's a really excellent book if you haven't read it. In, in this book, he talks about the three great revolutions in the evolution of the, civili of, of, of the human civilization. The cognitive revolution, which started 70 odd thousand years ago, then the agricultural, about 12,000 years ago, and then the scientific, most recently starting about 500 years ago. And the cognitive revolution is when language and art appeared for the first time. And this also allowed for the first time for stories and myths to take hold, to become more complex, to become much more widely disseminated. And because they became more complex and more adaptable, larger numbers of people were able to buy into them. And these stories are absolutely essential because they allow for much more widespread collaboration than would otherwise be possible. Many of you may have heard of Robin Dunbar. He's a, he's a, um, um, a psychologist and anthropologist at Magdalen College, Oxford. He did a study where he compared frontal cortex size to the number of relationships that an organism could hold. It's not actually frontal cortex, it's frontal cortex in relation to overall brain. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and the number he came up for humans was 147.8. So 150 relationships is the maximum that a single human being can maintain. And so unless there are larger stories to buy into, societies can never grow beyond about that size of 150. Indeed, the maximum number of people you can know, even at the most rudimentary level, i.e. putting a name to a face, is about 1,500. And we're obviously living in societies of millions, hundreds of millions, even billions of people now. And so these cultural stories are absolutely essential to the cohesion of these larger societies. So the point, the, the, the next question is, well, are the stories that we're using to bind our society together, together, excuse me, are they useful, are they helpful, are they constructive? So let's take a look at some of them. And here's our old friend money, right? What does money bring about? Well, money brings about selfish behavior. It brings about a sense of uh, disconnectedness from the true value of things, an artificial sense of competition between people, the need to chip off each other. It leads to scarcity, which in turn leads to mis mistrust in society, which uh, they're, they're decaying social institutions because they can no longer be funded. And greed above all, because what is greed really? other than a fear of scarcity in the future. Why would you hoard stuff unless you're worried that sometime down the road you're not going to have enough, right? So greed is actually rooted in something very reasonable, long-term security, but it, it gets out of control when prompted by things like money. Scarcity, already gone through. Nationhood, I mean, I'll just give you a minute to look at this slide because this pretty much encapsulates what I want to say. <laughs> I think it's really good. This was doing the rounds on Facebook a little while ago. I think it's really excellent. But, uh, I mean, I think you could summarise this as nations lead to war and lead to suspicion of the other. Or actually, it's probably the other way around, right? Suspicion of the other, which in turn leads to war. Then we have our old friends, religion and God. You know, religion and God gives a, removes a sense of personal responsibility, removes the need to question things, impedes your ability to learn anything because, well, hey, I can't go against... What I've been told is true, separates us from nature, leads to guilt, the concept of sin. Um, you know, there, there, there's a long list. I don't, I, I'm not really here to go through all that. I just want to look at, you know, take a brief overview of some of the main stories that we use in our society. Material science is one of the newest, most pervasive stories that exist. And what does material science tell us? It tells us we're machines. If you're machines, then you treat each other as machines. It teaches us that the world is just a bunch of stuff out there for us to use any way that we wish to. And so despite the fact that um, these things are killing us in the long run, these stories are actually more real. These cultural myths, these cultural narratives are more real to us than the real world. I mean, just as a trivial example, how many people know the Coke logo versus what an oak leaf looks like? You know what I mean? Yeah, the, 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 this artificial world of stories that we've created for ourselves is more real than the actual real world. And, uh, yeah, and we cling to them despite the fact that it's going to end up killing us. I love this picture. <clears throat> Again, I'll just give you a minute to read this before I uh, go on to my next point, which is talking about the shadow. And so, like I said, we're living in bad stories, and these stories are bad because they encourage us to live in shadow. By that I mean, 
These are the 12 archetypes that I had up on that colored wheel earlier on. When those archetypes are realized, when those archetypes are lived in truth, when those archetypes are lived in the light, these are the qualities that each of those archetypes brings to the table, brings into the world. However, when that archetype lives in fear, when that archetype lives in shadow, this is what manifests in the world instead. Now take a look at the red list, take a look at the black list. What do you see more of in this world today? And the shadow is rooted entirely in fear and denial. Um, I think a really good way of summarizing what the shadow is, this is a quote, I think this is Jung himself saying, all that you are not, you also are. Now the shadow is those repressed bits of you that you don't like to re that you don't like to acknowledge are there. For example, if you think of yourself as a kind and generous and compassionate and decent person who doesn't like to upset others, then you may very well find that as a consequence of maintaining that self-image, when you're faced with a situation that demands of you forthright and assertive behaviour, that you are insufficiently forthright and assertive. As a consequence of that, you start to feel bitterness and resentment and this builds up over time but you don't really want to face it because it goes against your image of yourself and so it's relegated to the shadow doesn't mean it doesn't exist none of us are free of our shadows but until you start to learn to integrate your shadow you cannot be an effective agent of change in this world and we are forced to live by the systems that we endure we are forced to live predominantly in shadow and it's up to individuals to realize that fact, find a way to integrate their shadow so that they can be more effective agents of positive change in this world. This is just another quick diagram, I'm not going to spend long on this, but this is the 12 archetypes properly realized in the light. These are their shadows when expressed through, when expressed in shadow or expressed through fear. So the patriarch becomes the dictator, the angel becomes the victim, the magician becomes the sorcerer. And you see it's a, it's a similar idea but turned on its head. There's a model that I kind of like better. These guys here, Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette, wrote this book, King Warrior, Magician, Lover. It's the same idea, it's a very Jungian concept, but they've distilled the 12 Jungian archetypes down to four, namely those ones. And their concept of the shadow, it's kind of easier to get your head around in some ways, their concept of the shadow is that the, when you live in shadow, you're living in one or other of the polar opposites, which when transcended and united, make up the properly expressed archetype. And again, once again, just very quickly, look at the bottom line, look at the top line, what do you see more of in this world? More masculine archetypes. Well, these are the masculine at the top, feminine at the bottom. That's 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 how this is broken down. And I mean, there's there's more uh, sort of shadow masculine energy in the world that is making it dysfunctional. I yes, I would agree. I think broadly that's true. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But I mean, you know, they do make the point in the book that the masculine and feminine do not reside entirely in men and women. You know what I mean? That the masculine and the feminine resides in both men and women. Um, Again, I'll just give you a minute, so I've kind of made this point, but it makes it better. I love that. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by, but by making the darkness conscious. This guy here is another guy that's uh, really influenced my thinking about uh, Charles Eisenstein. He's a natural philosopher. Um, the stories that I talked through earlier, money, nation, religion, etc., 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 he groups those and many, many other of our cultural narratives under the umbrella of what he calls the story of separation, that all of these stories are designed or have, have become, whether designed or not, have, 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 have come about to separate us from each other, to separate us from the natural world, to disconnect us from our power, to disconnect us from our knowledge of who we are. And there are two ideas of his in particular that I would just like to acquaint you with very quickly. The first is um, the idea of the, open, uh, sorry, the, of the gifting economy. He, he turns the whole idea of an economy on its head. And so at the moment, things I mentioned earlier on, greed is hoarding due to fear of scarcity in the future. And that provides you with some security. And security in a gift economy comes from the fact that you know that whatever you need is out there and people are happy to give it to you, just as you are happy to give whatever you are able to give to the world. And your status 
um, and value in society is now perceived not by how much you have, but by how much you give. It turns the whole thing up on its head. The other idea he talks about, which I really like, is the idea of peaks of understanding and that the, the, the current narratives that we've been using in society have taken us as high as they can possibly take us. They are flawed and they take us as high as they can possibly take us and that people are becoming aware of the fact that there's a better peak of understanding over there. But in order to get from here to there, you've got to go round down into the valley in order to ascend the next peak, right? And that this is one of the main barriers holding us back, is that people are fearful of descending into the valley, because in the valley is the unknown. In the valley, you have to face the dragon, and only when you face the dragon can you grab the treasure and enter the world as a meaningful agent of change. And this is, this is the final theme of my talk, is the hero's journey, as described by this guy, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell spent his whole life studying mythologies from all over the world, and what he was particularly looking for were similarities and differences between those mythologies, and he would attribute similarities to um, elements of our psyche, which are common to all human beings everywhere, you know, rooted in our biology, um, and is not cultural, and, and the differences in the narratives he attributed to cultural influences. And so themes like uh, slaying the dragon, themes like resurrection, themes like the wise mentor, these appear all over the world across vast time spans, completely independently of each other, with no possibility of these uh, groups having communicated with each other. And so I think it's reasonable to assume that these, these are themes which reside deep in our psyche, according to the archetypes that I, that I went through earlier with you. This is a... Uh, sort of circular representation of the hero's journey. He's written a whole book about this, which I highly recommend you read. It is both inspirational and educational. Um, this is a much simplified version of it. I'm going to use this one just very quickly. Like I said, I don't have a huge amount of time, lots of ideas uh, to talk you through it. So the beginning of the hero's journey is right here. This is the call to adventure. And I'm assuming that most of you are in this room right now because you have experienced that, right? You felt that call to adventure. That's why you're here right now. And uh, wondering what you can actually do to bring meaningful, positive change to the world. Uh, the call is sometimes refused for whatever reason. It might be fear, it might be circumstances of your life, whatever it may be. But around about here, this is the important transition. You're transiting from the ordinary world into the special world. And your transition through the special world, it, this is the process of death and rebirth. This is the resurrection. The story of the resurrection comes, this is the idea underlying the story of resurrection. Because when you cross the threshold, you then encounter resources both within yourself and outside yourself that you never knew you had. You are tested. You meet people who are going to help you. And when you are on a hero's journey, because this is something which resides deep in the psyche of every single one of us, when you are on your hero's journey, other people recognize that you're on the hero's journey and they stand ready to help you because they... You, you know, whether consciously or not, they realize that that's what you're doing and they stand ready to help. The, the final ordeal is your confrontation with the dragon. But what does the dragon guard? The dragon guards the treasure. And having seized the treasure from the dragon, shaken off your shadow, overcome your inner demon, whatever it might be, it doesn't have to be. The hero's journey can be gone through many times in one lifetime. The hero's journey does not have to be as dramatic as the trials of Perseus, right? You know, the hero's journey can be much more mundane than that. But you re-emerge out of the special world, reborn as a new version of yourself, ready to undertake the task which called you to adventure in the first place. Do you see what I mean? And I, I, and I think conceptualizing yourself as being on that hero's journey, heeding the call to action, making sacrifices, enduring unbearable hardships, discovering resources in yourself that you never knew you had, you never knew you had only to emerge victorious having slain the dragon back into the world as a much better version of yourself. It's, it's an inspirational thing and it can provide motivation when you're thinking that you know, really, nothing, nothing seems to be changing. I don't know how many of you have seen Infinity War. I love this film. It made it, made it, it by far, by far the best of the Marvel movies. The reason I bring it up here, having just discussed the hero's journey, I mean, anyone that's watched it, most of the people I've spoken to watched this movie felt a great deal of sympathy for Thanos. Didn't hate Thanos. He wasn't a bad guy, right? Understood where he was coming from. And the reason for that is that Thanos is on the hero's journey. If you think about what Thanos goes through, call to action, great sacrifice, you know what I mean? In order, so that Thanos is very, very much on the hero's journey, just like Thor is. Thor and Thanos go through very, very similar stages in their journeys in, in Infinity War. 
I've kind of alluded to this, this is a great quote from Bobby Kennedy, but the point is that by uh, living more harmoniously, more uh, generously, more kindly in the world, by forming little collaborations with those people around you, you form little islands within this desert of shadow, you form little islands of light, and you inspire other people to, inform their, to, to, to form their little islands of light, and those little islands start to overlap with each other, and before you know it, You've created a new culture because that's all the culture is, is the stories and interactions that go on in the people that exist within it. And so each and every individual has a very real and a very meaningful role to play in changing the cultural substrate that I mentioned at the start of this. And so the last thing I want to do is just draw your attention to a couple of people that I think are doing exactly that, doing, doing their bit to change the events of history in their, in their own little ways. Um, this is a YouTube channel that I came across. I've obviously become very interested in stories and mythology in, in the last year or so, and this is a really fantastic YouTube channel. What he does is he looks at um, modern movies through the lens of archetype and story and mythology, and uh, I just want to show you a two-minute clip. Cloud Atlas is one of my absolute favorite all-time movies, and uh, he does a beautiful analysis of Cloud Atlas and how beauty will save the world. Um, and I just want to show you, I put, together, I put together a little edited clip of about two minutes. Of All right, so there's one more picture on my presentation, but it doesn't matter, I can get started with the story in the meantime. There's one work of art, having just mentioned art in that clip, there's one work of art that I, that, that, that I particularly love, which I wanted to show. But uh, just to finish with one final story, um, it's a story about an old man who uh, likes to go fishing, and so every day he goes down to the seawall, and he sits on the seawall and he catches a couple of fish, he takes them home to his family, cooks them up and they eat them together. He's been doing this for years and years and he very, he leads a very simple life. And uh, he's sitting on his wall fishing one day when a tourist in a boat rows by him and they get talking. Um, and the tourist says to him, so you come down here every day, you must, you, know, you must know the fishing pretty well here. And he says, oh yes, of course, yeah, I've been doing it for a long time, I don't want to brag, but yeah, of course. Um, so why don't you catch a couple of extra fish and, you know, sell them? Well, that's a new rod. You could buy yourself a net. You could catch even more fish. You know, you could you could make a nice living for yourself. Uh, okay, and then, and then what would I do? Well, you could you know, if you wanted to, you could buy a boat. You could start employing people. You know, you could go into major production. Yeah, and and, and then what would I do? Well, once you've got enough money, you don't have to do anything at all. You can retire and sit around all day fishing. <laughs> So again, a simple little story, but one final thought before I leave you. The two little stories that I've told you, the muscle story and the old man story, I mean, the two characters that you identify with this, in the first one, if you think about it, the muscle is going on a journey, right? Has to go on a journey, can't bear to stay where he is. In the second story, you've got the exact opposite. A man doesn't want to go on any kind of a journey. He's very, very content and very happy where he is. And so, you know, neither of these things are right, neither of these things are wrong. We identify with both characters because we see validity in both of those perspectives. The reason we like both of these characters, the reason they are the heroes in, our, in these stories, is because they are doing what they do. They're making the choices that they make in the full knowledge of what they are doing, what they are sacrificing and what they are gaining in making those choices, and taking complete responsibility for doing so. Our society encourages the exact opposite kind of behaviour. It does not encourage us to take responsibility. It does not encourage us to make positive choices. And so, my final plea, I guess, is as individuals, we need to, every single one of us, work on getting out of the shadow that society has pushed us into and start creating those little islands of light in the darkness so that they can start connecting with each other. And uh, I, I really do believe that it is at the individual level and at the level of story, myth, narrative, changing the cultural substrate from which the systems ultimately grow, I do think that that is the most meaningful thing that we as individuals and as small groups can do. Last thing, this is a guy called Android Jones. He's been contributing to Burning Man for many years now. And I just think this is a really beautiful piece of art. Uh, it, it, it does so many things for me. You know, it, it, it speaks to um, our connectedness, not just to each other, but to the world around us. Um, it speaks to a sort of unfolding sense of understanding reality and our role in creating it. And I, I just think it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And uh, that's really all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening.